Well, good morning. Today we want to look at the memory verse that we had throughout 40 Days of Restoration, and I hope lots of you memorized it because it's ever so rich. In fact, you might almost think it's too rich. It's hard to wrap your head around this. It's a rich, dense verse from a rich, dense passage in a rich, dense chapter of the richest and densest book, I think, in the whole of the Bible. So I could understand if, uh, if you kind of struggle to wrap your head around it or to fully digest it. And that's why we really want to pick it apart today. I'm going to read it to you again. Hopefully you've all got it in your heads already, but here it is. Since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. And as we walk through this verse, we're going to see that it spans the whole of eternity from before the creation of the earth to after the end of it, and that it's absolutely packed with ideas. But they're such important ideas that it's well worth doing the work. We're going to break it down into four things. We're going to ask, well, five, sorry. We're going to ask five questions. First one, what we're talking about is our friendship with God. Then we're going to ask what happened to that friendship. And the answer is going to be, it was restored. How was it restored? By the death of God's son. When did this happen? While we were still his enemies. And finally, what follows? We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Now, why are we going to go to all this trouble to pick all this apart, to, to do all this complicated analysis? I'll tell you why. We were in the coffee and chat last week um, after the service in the online coffee and chat. David Grice was there and he was uh, asking why it is that we sometimes find it so hard to trust God. And the reason I think is because we trust the people that we know, don't we? We trust our parents, um, we trust a husband or wife, uh, people that we've known for a long time and who have built up a relationship and we understand what kind of people they are. And that's why it's so important that we know and understand God. You know, we cannot trust him unless we understand what he's like. So that's why we're going to pick all this apart. And I'm going to start, well, at the beginning of the verse. Here we go. The first thing then, the subject of it all, our friendship with God. Now, this is the great promise of Christianity, and it's unique. You know, a Muslim would consider the idea of being friends with Allah to be blasphemous. Uh, and a Buddhist, if you asked him about being friends with God, would think you were just talking nonsense, that the idea would make no sense in his head. In Sikhism, God is considered formless, sovereign, unknowable, and absolute. Now, how can you have friendship with a formless, unknowable God? So, religions across the world, this idea just doesn't come up at all. Uh, and uh, one place outside of Christianity that you see it, of course, the first flickerings of the idea is in Judaism and in the Old Testament. Uh, and in the Old Testament, a tiny number of special people were called friends of God. That said about Abraham and about Moses, sort of implied about Enoch and about David. But that's it. it it's very much uh, a special thing for special people. But when you come to the New Testament, the idea comes to its full flourishing. When Jesus is talking to his disciples in John chapter 15, verse 15, he says, I no longer call you servants because a master doesn't confide in his servants. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything the Father told me. And what he said then to those 12 disciples, he says now to all his disciples around the world that he calls us friends. Now, I don't want to missell this. I don't want to give a misleading idea. I'm not saying that the kind of friendship we have with God is like the kind of friendship we have with your mate Steve, who you go down the pub with and watch football matches. You know, you, you don't discuss the, the merits of playing three at the back with God. You don't have that kind of back and forth in conversation, at least not in our life at the moment. So... What's meant by friendship with God is something a little different from that. But we are headed for a degree of closeness and intimacy with God and enjoyment of God that is far beyond anything we can understand now. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see face to face. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. What a promise that is, that we will know God as well as he knows us. What a promise. 
So that's friendship with God. That's the prize. That's what we're talking about today. So then let's go on and see what else this memory verse has to tell us about it. What happened to this friendship? It was restored. Now, if something is restored, it must be because it was broken. If something never gets damaged, it doesn't need to be restored. And restored means to be put back the way it was meant to be. So what's being put back the way it was meant to be? Well, when you go back and read the early chapters of Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve, uh, whether you believe those chapters are literal or figurative, what's really clear either way is that they're telling us that humans were created to be God's friends, to walk with him, to talk with him. And the idea here, when this verse talks about our friendship with God was restored, is to get things back how they were intended to be. And, you know, we look back on the last seven weeks, um, 40 days of restoration. That's not just about getting back to how things were before COVID. It's not about going back 18 months. You know, we need to look further back than that. It's not just about going back however long it might be, 50 or 100 years to when Christian morality was prevalent in the UK, if there ever was such a time. It's not about that. We need to look much further back. What we are looking for is restoration to what God intended for all of us even before the physical universe began. Before the physical universe began, Mike, can that be right? Yeah, it is right. Listen to this. Ephesians chapter 1. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Now That's an incredible thing. Before the world was formed, you know, in Paul's understanding of the world, he would have basically meant everything that there is, not just this planet, not just the earth, the whole physical universe. So what we're talking about here is a plan that God has had for at least 15 billion years. And has he given up on this idea now? In this world where so many people are his enemies? No, he's not given up on it. Of course he hasn't. The world that we live in now is, is broken, it's polluted, it's distorted. But God has not given up on it. And you know, if we can just take a little digression here. One of the great mysteries in the New Testament is this idea that all of creation will eventually be restored along with us. Uh, this is Paul again, now writing in the book to Romans. He says in chapter 8, All creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. That's us, right? Those of us who accept the offer of friendship with God. Against its will, he says, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Now look, this restoration won't be complete until the final day. Exactly what it means for creation to be restored, I don't know. I can't tell you that. I don't think anyone can really, but the promise is there. Whatever the detail of it means, that's the promise. So do you remember I said at the beginning, the verse we're talking about here echoes right back to before the foundation of the earth and forward to after the end of the physical universe. And all of this is wrapped up in God's goodness to us. We have got so much to look forward to. Now, you know, all of this that I'm talking about is in our future. The focus of the verse that we learned in the last seven weeks uh, is about what happened in the past, how our friendship with God was restored. But we want to remember as well, and we'll see later on, that it's also being restored now in the present as God works in us. So we'll get to that shortly. Stay tuned. Now let's look at the third thing. So we've said, uh, one, our friendship with God. Two, was restored. And then three, how was it restored? The answer is by the death of his son. Not by our hard work. Do you know, let's get back to our friends, the Sikhs we mentioned earlier on. Uh, Sikhism was founded by Guru Nanak, who taught that living an active, creative and practical life of truthfulness, fidelity, self-control and purity establishes union with God. Sounds good, right? Uh, the thing is, I can't do that and I don't think you can either. And do you know all religions offer some similar promise and in the end, they're all promises of despair. The promise that if we make all the right choices, if we live the right life, if we do everything as we should, if we work hard enough, we can satisfy God, uh, is what you'll hear in every religion except one. You know, it's one of the ways Christianity is unique, isn't it? That it has 
the honesty and the humility to accept that we just can't make those right choices and live in the right ways and work hard enough to satisfy God. That's the reality. Christianity requires humility. It invites us to accept these unwelcome truths about ourselves. But of course, that's also the good news because it means that once we accept we can't save ourselves, we can clearly see that God's offer is to save us anyway by the death of his son. Now, all Christians agree that the way our friendship with God is restored is by the death of Jesus on the cross. Uh, let's read, skip ahead of the end now back into Ephesians. Here's what Paul says about this. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. So that's clear. Right? It's clear that God gives us this great gift of salvation and of life because of the cross. But Christians through the centuries, well, millennia now, have argued about how the cross works. You know, why should it be that the death of Jesus results in our life? It's odd, isn't it, when you think about it? Um, what's the answer? Well, there are many answers. It's been a bone of contention among theologians. And I'm just going to super quickly run you through six of the different theories that have been proposed. And you don't need to, to memorize all this. Just get a random feeling for it. Here we go. One of them is called the ransom theory. The idea that the death of Jesus was a payment to the devil in exchange for our lives. That he had a claim on us because of sin and that Jesus paid off that claim. Second one is called Christus Victor, which basically just means um, uh, Christ who won the victory. And the idea is that in dying and rising from death, the power of Jesus defeated death. Third one, the satisfaction theory, the idea that God's sense of justice was satisfied by Jesus' death. And then the fourth one is called the penal substitution theory. And the idea here is that there is a punishment for sin, but because Jesus took that punishment, it no longer falls on us. Uh, keep up, everyone. Uh, the scapegoat theory is another one. And here the idea is that by becoming a victim, the victim of our sin, Jesus has taken away the power of that sin over us to make us his victim. And another is the healing theory, which is that we by nature are sick and need a doctor, and that by Jesus' wounds we are healed. So the, um, the wounds that were laid on him were taken off us. Now, that's only half a dozen. There are others out there. And you possibly now are asking, but which of these is correct? Uh, I want to say I, I don't think that's even the right question to ask. You know, the reality here is that what God worked for us in Jesus on the cross is so rich. It's so rich. It's so multifaceted that all of these are only glimpses, I believe, uh, of the reality. You know, we can look at it from all these different directions, six directions and others, and each of them will tell us a valuable truth about what God did for us there. But it's a terrible mistake, I think, to cling to one of them and say, yes, this is correct. You know, it's like looking at a, a house from a particular direction and seeing what shape it looks in that direction and saying that's the shape of the house. You know, it's not false. That is the shape of the house, but it's not the only shape of the house. It's not the full story. It's only one perspective. But all of these different things that different theologians have suggested through the years, all these different ways that God works the death of Christ for our life, I think all of these give us real glimpses of the incredible thing that happened there 2,000 years ago. Do you know a specific moment in history where heaven and earth and hell collided, where everything was just completely reconfigured, everything changed there so powerfully that it even worked back in time. And we think about people, um, Abraham and David, and people who were called friends of God in the Old Testament. Why was it possible for sinful people to be friends of God? Because of the cross. That happened a thousand years later. That's how powerful it is. So, our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son. When did that happen? And now we come to maybe the most shocking part of this whole passage. It tells us while we were still his enemies. When Jono was very young, uh, Fiona and I were telling him uh, that Jesus says to love your enemies. And he, he 
just pulled us up short and said, no, no, that's wrong. He corrected us. He said, no, you made a mistake. Love your friends, hate your enemies. Now, that's completely natural and it's completely wrong. It's one of the ways where living as a Christian genuinely requires a supernatural perspective and a supernatural power. It doesn't come naturally to us, does it, to love our enemies? It's not a normal thing to do. It's a weird thing to do. How can we do something like that? And also, why? Why would we do that? Why would we love our enemies? Well, the answer is because we are the sons and daughters of God, and that's what he does. That's what he did for each one of us. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, Paul writes this, You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And if we're his children, we need to bear family likeness. You know, we don't love our enemies just because someone thought it was a good idea. We do it because God loved his enemies when that was us. And if we look at our enemies with unforgiveness, and if we hate people who do wrong to us, then what we're saying is, yeah, sure, God's forgiven us, but other people don't get that. We're not going to forgive just because God forgave us. What a ridiculous thing for us to say. Do you know, I don't think God ever asks us to do anything that he hasn't done himself, with the sole exception, of course, of repenting of sin, because God is sinless. But everything that he asks us to do, he's already done. And when he tells us to love our enemies, he's telling us who were his enemies and who he loved when we were his enemies. He's telling us to do exactly what he did. So, our friendship with God, point one, was restored, point two. Point three, by the death of his son. Point four, while we were still his enemies. And finally, I want to talk about, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son, which was the end of the memory verse. And Fiona and I really liked the way Michelle Williams read this out uh, last week when they were playing the videos of all the people reading memory verses. And she really emphasised his death in the first half and his life in the second half. Let me read it to you in the style of Michelle Williams. I'm not going to do the voice, but listen to this. Since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So what's this about? What is the life of God's son? Well, I think it's about two things. One of them is Jesus' resurrection, his triumph over death, showing that his sacrifice was accepted and completed. But the other is his life now. Now, I should have looked up the verse here, but the Bible tells us somewhere that Jesus right now is interceding for us. In other words, pleading our cause. He's on our side. And you know, the first four parts of this verse, our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies. Those are all past tense words. Our friendship with God was restored while we were still his enemies. But now, in verse 5, suddenly we're switching into the present and the future. We certainly will be saved through the life of his son. This is about what he's doing in us now. You know, the death of Jesus was one fixed point in the past, but his life is ongoing and eternal. It continues today, tomorrow and onwards. And in the same way, while God made a permanent single act of salvation in saving each one of us who have come to him, so he continues to work salvation in us. Salvation is ongoing and eternal breathing more of his life into us, giving more of his grace to us. Uh, John Piper writes, God the Father himself has worked in the past decisively and will work in the future infallibly to rescue us from his wrath. Now he's right, but if I were going to be critical of John Piper, okay, that's harsh, but uh, what the heck, let's go ahead and do it. What's missing from this quote is the present. Now he's absolutely right, God has worked in the past decisively and he will work in the future infallibly, but it's also true that God is working in us today. And what God has already done through Jesus in the past gives us confidence of what he is doing in us now, today, and will do in the future. God's work in us, in one sense, is complete. Nothing needs to be added to his salvation. In another sense, it continues day by day as he works in us. It transforms us from one degree of glory to another as we more and more resemble Jesus. So... How do we live now? 
well, we enjoy God. We enjoy every good gift in this life that he's given us. We recognise it being from him. But also we do these things. We love our enemies instead of hating them. We show gratitude instead of bitterness. We are generous instead of mean. We share other people's joys instead of envying them when things go right for them. We repent of our sins instead of excusing them. And we tell other people what we've found. Um, and there's so much more, of course. I'm not going to list all aspects of a Christian life in the 30-second chunk at the very end of this message. But here's the thing. Just as God saved us 2,000 years ago through his son, so he works in us now through his son. That's what this memory verse tells us. Do you know, let's just read it one more time. Right? The memory verse. Since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. God works through Jesus and is at work in us. The Apostle John puts it very starkly in his first letter. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have God's son does not have life. So I just want to close with this. If you're not a Christian, if you haven't received this great gift of grace and of love and of joy from God, then please don't delay. Seek him out. Find him. Find out more. Look for him. If you are a Christian, don't rest on your laurels. You know, don't look at the grace that God has given you and say, OK, I've got that now. Thanks. And then just kind of cruise control through the rest of your life. No, more. Look for more. Why? God is at work in you now. He's worked in the past. He's at work now. He's got so much more for you. He wants to do so much more in you and through you and for you. And he wants to make you so much more than you have ever imagined. So come to the Son, the Son of God through whom he's worked salvation and through whom he will complete salvation and in whom he is now working salvation in each of us.